And today we have um, with us Josh Lilpop. And um, I'm going to introduce Josh and then we're going to let Josh take it away. I'm really excited to hear this hear this presentation. I've, I've learned, I know a little bit about prescribed fire and I think it's a great tool. Um, but Josh is a graduate of um, Eastern Kentucky University with a degree in wildlife management. He served on the landowner incentive programs prescribed fire crew where they spent three months each year conducting prescribed burns from one end of the state to the other. In 2008, Josh became a public lands manager for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources and routinely used fire as a management tool on public and private lands while serving as a regional burn boss. And I guess we'll learn about what a burn boss is in his presentation. In 2017, he moved to the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves and has served as the fire management officer for the last four years. He's been an active member of the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council for nine years and is currently serving as the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council board president. In addition to serving as the um, fire uh, manager management officer at the um, state nature preserves, he is also responsible for staff supervision and management of approximately 40,000 acres owned by the nature preserves, as well as monitoring of conservation easements for more than 100,000 acres is part of the Heritage Land Conservation Fund. Josh has implemented prescribed burns in Kentucky every year since 2005 and is a strong advocate for the use of prescribed fire in managing natural areas in Kentucky. So with that, I want to welcome you and thank you, Josh, um, for joining us today and sharing um, your knowledge and your experience about um, prescribed fire as a management tool here in Kentucky. Great. Thank you, Lori. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. You sound good. I will turn my uh, video off and my volume. And, and that is, I will say this, everyone, as you all have questions, please type those in the chat pod and I will, um, Josh will have the opportunity to answer those at the end of his presentation. All right. Thank you, Josh. All right. Great. Um, I should be sharing my screen now. If not, please let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to get going here. You look good. You look good. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, fire has been a big part of my career. It's something that I, I believe is a, a really useful and important tool for, for land managers and conservation in the state. So I'm happy to be here and talk with you about that. Um, before we get going too much, I want to kind of touch on who we are and what we do. Um, there's a list of duties here. I'll let you read through that. But in general, we buy and protect land uh, for the preservation of natural communities and rare species. We maintain a database of those records and we also collect information species across the whole state regardless of whether we own the property or not. We use that information to provide a clearinghouse of, of data and information that state and federal partners use for conservation planning and decision making. And um, then we also are overseers of the Wild Rivers Program and the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund. So we've got our fingers in a lot of conservation uh, across the state here. We, um, <clears throat> our natural heritage database includes over 18,000 uh, source features and about 15,000 element occurrences. And we launched the KBAT a couple of years ago, which is an online tool that uh, state and federal and private interests can use um, to pull information from our database about potential impacts that their projects might have. Um, and so this is used in the planning process, or if you're just curious what might be nearby you um, or what you would want to manage for, uh, this might be um, so we'll start off talking about uh, Kentucky as a whole and, and looking at the landscape. Um, you know, this map was is a few years old, but I think it's still representative of Kentucky. We've got a lot of open agricultural land, a um, little bit of forest down in the southeast there. If we updated this map today, we'd probably see a little bit more red, a little less green, uh, maybe some more of the open agricultural land. But so this is. Uh, you know what we came up with for now but we also went back and looked at our data and looked at some information and tried to recreate what Kentucky looked like in the past uh, prior to European settlement and one of the big um, uh, responsibilities of nature preserves is, is to help preserve those communities and those natural uh, resources that were around at the time of settlement and make sure that our our urbanization and, and a lot of what our society does now doesn't make those things disappear so that they're preserved for future generations so if we look at this map depiction here of what we think settlement uh, Kentucky looked like prior to settlement, um, you know, we've got grasslands, forest lands, woodlands, and savannas. And um, 
don't know if you can see my pointer here, but you can see the grasslands that kind of extend out around the Barron County area, up in Hardin County, up to the Ohio River. We've got um, woodland savanna that occurred in the bluegrass region and even down in the plateau, the Cumberland Plateau is, is kind of this, this area that runs right through here and then mostly forested in the southeastern U.S. Um, and we're going to come back to this and this is going to be important for why fire is a, is a tool for managers in Kentucky and, and why that's helping us conserve and protect our rare and uh, natural communities. If you look at the map, this is a map of um, you know, all the sites that Nature Preserves is involved in with the state. Um, we've got sites from one end to the other. We partner with a lot of other agencies. And one thing I'd like to point out here is that um, if you look and kind of notice where a lot of these properties are at, you know, this is kind of that ring of grassland habitat pre-European settlement. This is kind of that woodland savanna area in the inner and outer bluegrass where they meet. These are the sites along the Cumberland Plateau um, that I pointed out in Pine Mountain here. So, you know, there's a reason why we're buying sites in these areas and protecting these sites. And it's all tied back to uh, that pre-European settlement land cover type that was on in Kentucky. So we got a, we have a team of managers that go out and work on these sites, um, spend a lot of time and energy uh, putting in long hours and long days uh, to do invasive species work, um, treat hemlocks, uh, clean trash out of uh, drains and, and haulers from previous uh, land use, uh, implement prescribed fire forest management, um, you know, and they do a great job. And fire is a big tool um, that we use and we rely heavily on it to do our job of pre preserving natural communities and rare species. So we'll start our discussion about fire here in this sandstone uh, limestone barrens complex. And, um, you know, this is just a, this is a site that we own that's not open to the public because of the rare species and the sensitivity to the site. But this picture kind of depicts, I think, where we need to start this conversation about how fire can be used to preserve Kentucky's natural heritage. Um, and you may, you may know this term already, succession. Um, and this, this kind of depicts succession. When we talk about succession in ecological terms, we're talking about how an area uh, consistently succeeds into a higher level of, of vegetation or uh, plant community. And so a lot of times, if it's a rocky area, we, we talk about the term primary succession. We're talking about a, a rocky, really just rugged, low soil area, lichens and mosses move in, over time, grasses can move in, then slowly the shrubs move in, and eventually that moves to a mature forest. Now we know this happens um, across all landscapes that over time they succeed in the, to these different levels. And so we have to ask the question, if we know that this happens everywhere, and, and you all know that this happens too, you may not realize it, but um, what happens if you don't mow your lawn for three or four weeks, right? It starts to get thicker. Um, what happens to that field that you drive by every day when the mower doesn't, when the farmer doesn't go out and mow it? You start to see trees popping up in there. You start to see it become more shrubbier, right? And if that's left alone, uh, we can probably all think of an area near our home that we've driven by that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago was an open grassland that was cut for hay. And now it's a young forest with closed canopy and, and shaded. Um, that's, that's succession there. And the reason we have to talk about succession is because how does a grassland stay a grassland if everything moves along this gradient? And so here's just a nice little infograph that kind of depicts this a little bit. So, but how do we maintain these levels of plant communities if everything is constantly moving through the spectrum? And the way that we do that is through, um, well, the natural way that occurs is through ecological disturbance. Right, and so this can be, uh, this is a really intense environmental stress that occurs over a short period of time that changes the ecosystem. Um, it can affect the spatial distribution of species on the landscape. It can affect the species composition. And what we mean by that is it can shift um, species that occur in one area to occur in a different area. It can actually change from a grassland uh, or from a shrubland to a grassland. It can encourage one species over another species. Um, and so these events like flooding, tornadoes, wildfires, insects, winds, storm damage, uh, ice storm damage can all have an impact on that. And this can happen at a, a much smaller level, um, but we're kind of kind of talk about disturbance on more of a landscape or a larger level at the community level. And so when we talk about plant communities, 
hopefully you understand that. That's an assemblage of, of plants that occur in a particular area, typically based on the soils, geology, um, the weather patterns, the aspect, uh, moisture levels, you know, all these things kind of affect that plant community. And, and we know that given the right soils, the right exposure and all this and the right um, spatial distribution, you know, depending on where you're at, whether you're here or in the Southeast, what types of plant communities can occur there. And so if we think about flooding, you know, if an area that it's not used to water gets impounded and is impounded for a long time, that can have a pretty drastic effect on uh, the, the plant species that occur in that area. Same thing with ice damage, you know, up here in the right corner, we've got a, a picture of uh, an area that was ice damaged. So this, let me go back here. Um, this used to be a closed canopy forest and it, we had severe ice damage. And so now suddenly all those treetops that were shading the forest floor have broken out. They've been damaged. Some of those trees may die. They, they got to regrow, but we have drastically increased the sunlight at the forest floor. And that's going to have an impact on the spatial distribution and the species composition of that area for a long time after that event happens. In the bottom right corner, we've got um, insect damage from uh, the southern pine beetle that came in and, and killed pines that were overstory uh, trees and, and caused the same effect. When those trees fall out, it increases and changes the sunlight, changes the species composition for a while, and that system now has to recover and start moving through that successional stage again. We've got this picture of a bison here, and we don't think about this one much, but um, there's several rare species in Kentucky that are associated with old bison trails um, or areas where salt licks were. And, you know, these large uh, herds of herbivores that would move through an area, um, they had an impact. I mean, they were, you've all probably seen cattle move through and, and seen how they can rut up the ground and mess that up. Um, so that's, that's a type of ecological disturbance. Same thing with fire. Obviously, I think at this point, you can understand how fire could have an effect on, on an ecosystem or a community. Um, and these occurred as wildfires in the past. Um, prior to European settlement, Indians were lighting fires in Kentucky, and we have a lot of species that evolved with fire as part of, part of the system. And when we talk about grasslands, um, they kind of depend on fire as a natural disturbance. So we've got some really great biologists and ecologists that work for us, and they went through and looked at our database, and what they found was that about 60 to 65 percent of the rare species and natural communities that we track here um, are associated with a grassland community that needs some level of disturbance to persist, right? We've got to have that disturbance, otherwise that grassland will over time succeed into a shrubland and a forest. Um, and so for the purposes of our discussion today, when we talk about grassland communities, I'm including in that uh, any prairie, which is probably what you're picturing in your mind when I say grassland, you know, it's pretty void of trees. It's got tall grasses and flowers. Um, we're talking about barrens, which, um, you know, is, a, is similar to a prairie, only there's a, a high presence, higher presence of trees and shrubs and kind of creates more of a complex where you have some areas that are grassy, some areas that are shrubby and they're all kind of mixed together. Savannas, which are similar to a barrens on a much larger scale. Um, and the trees are a little bit further apart. Uh, we're talking about woodlands. Woodlands are, um, you know, a forest that has trees. When you looked at it from a distance, you'd say, well, there's a forest over there. And when you got over there, you'd notice that there's grasses and, and forbs and herbaceous, um, a really well-developed herbaceous understory there. And that's because the trees are spread far enough apart that they're allowing sunlight to come through. And so uh, we're talking about woodlands and we'll talk specifically about a woodland project restoration project that we've got going on here in just a little bit. So as I throw around the term grassland community today, I'm really talking about um, any of these systems that I just listed and how we manage to, to provide for that. Because if you think about a woodland with these overstory trees and sunlight coming down, um, there's going to be regeneration of those, those tree species trying to grow up in those pockets of sunlight there. And how do we maintain that grassland under that grassland community underneath of there? And these woodlands and barrens and savannas, um, they provide a lot of niche habitats for a wide range of species. And so they're really important to conserve because not just the plants that occur there, but there's a lot of animals that benefit from having that heterogeneity of that system, that variation within it, rather than it all being the same, the same species across, across the landscape there. So let's go back to our pre-European settlement map here. And uh, we've talked about the grasslands, 
woodlands and, and savannas. And so a lot of this area here, we believe was more open forest, had a better developed uh, understory or, or not understory, but uh, herbaceous layer down at the ground level. Same thing with the Cumberland Plateau down in this area. When we look at the rare species in the state, and remember 60 to 65% of our rare species are tied to, to these grassland communities. When we look at rare species in the state, we find the same kind of spatial distribution that we've seen in our map of managed areas and our map of pre-European settlement grasslands. We find a lot kind of in the Bowling Green, Barron County area, up in the Hardin County and up to the Ohio River, along the inner and outer bluegrass, through the Cumberland Plateau here, and again at Pine Mountain. Um, you'll kind of notice a bit of a hole over here and that's where the coal fields are, so that's been heavily influenced. But so we find a lot of these, these rare species or declining species in these areas. And then we can go a step further and look at a map depicted um, by Julian Campbell several years ago that looked at the soils and the land type associations and looked at the potential uh, or how much fire was involved in these different systems to maintain them over, over time. And so this map kind of depicts um, the areas that received more fire or less fire depending on the land type association and the soils and the expected plant community that occurred in that area. And so you see we had a, um, a lot of fire in the Cumberland Plateau area. We had more frequent fire over in the grassland areas. You know, and in the past, um, when a wildfire would occur and we didn't have the division of forestry or firefighters or the threat to, um, you know, to people and structures, uh, these fires would ignite and, and they would burn for days or weeks. They could burn for miles or tens of miles or a hundred miles, um, you know, depending upon what the conditions were with the fuels and the, how they were arranged on the landscape and moisture and how long before the next rain event. And so over time, this, this um, you know, helped maintain these grassland communities underneath of uh, trees or in uh, prairies, glades, barrens, things of that nature. So let's, uh, since we're gonna get into talking specifically about prescribed fire and how we're using that a little more, I wanna define a couple of terms here. So wildland fire, when we talk about a wildland fire, a wildland fire is any non-structural fire other than a prescribed fire that occurs in a wild. Wildland's just a natural area. Uh, a prescribed fire is a fire ignited by management action to meet a specific objective. It includes a written and approved prescribed fire plan prior to ignition. And so a lot of times when we talk about fire, people picture the, uh, the wildfires out west and they picture, you know, what they saw in the news, which of course the news is going to use the, the most ooh and all uh, drastic video or photo to show what's going on out there. Um, but that's not typically the type of fire we're talking about when we're doing a prescribed fire. Typically, we're talking about a slow, slow moving fire that creeps through, has good ecological effects. Um, you know, we're going to use the wind and the weather and the fuels to help. Uh, achieve that. We don't want a, a raging wildfire that's running out of control because um, we just don't have the space or the ability to do that anymore given the number of people and structures and roads and things like that that are around. So I went back and looked. Um, I've written a lot of burn plans in my career and uh, I went back and looked and I was kind of amazed when I figured all this up but your typical burn plan uh, is going to be developed months before the burn is implemented, sometimes years. There's, that's a 12 to 20 page legal document that looks at every aspect of the burn, identifies the type of weather that we want, the type of fuels we want and all that stuff. We have a minimum of six to eight maps that are gonna show the topography, that are gonna show where our smoke's gonna go, that are gonna show um, where structures are, where other impacts to public health or public safety could occur. We have to contact the National Weather Service and they create a spot weather forecast, which looks at the elevation, the aspect, the fuel type in the very exact spot where we're going to be completing a burn. Then we do a complexity analysis that analyzes each of the 13 elements included in our legal burn plan and, and takes those and mitigates for the risk. And so if something's a high risk, if it's a high risk fuel, then we may use that complexity plan to develop a way to reduce that level of risk. We also require a minimum of two emails and three phone calls the day of the burn to notify emergency personnel, uh, local county leaders, state, state officials. 
And this entire burn plan goes through a peer review process where other certified burn bosses review it, provide comments and discussion, and then it ultimately has to be signed off by the, the power management officer or the director for an agency that's conducting the burn. So these are very robust, detailed, involved plans that have been developed over a long time before we're ever going out there and lighting that burn. So before we get too far into this, I want to explain a couple of very simple uh, prescribed fire concepts to you. Um, we talk about the fire triangle and there's three legs to this triangle. There's heat, oxygen, and fuel. If you remove any one of those legs, the triangle, the triangle will fail. You know, the fire will go out. So if we can get rid of the oxygen, which isn't very easy to do, um, you know, we've got heat, uh, which we're going to start by lighting the, the flame uh, with a lighter or a drip torch or something to that effect, and then the fuel. Um, and so in developing burn plans and stuff, we're looking at the types of fuels, we're looking at the moisture level in the fuels. If we want a really hot fire that's going to have a really good, strong ecological impact and essentially set back succession significantly, then um, we want those fuels to be really dry. We want them to be continuous across the site. And then we want to allow that fire to move across the site at a rate that increases the residency time. And I'll get to that term in a minute. Um, and that's going to have a better effect. If, um, you know, if we're just trying to clear it off for um, uh, a restoration or in preparation for herbicide, we may use a faster moving fire um, that goes through and basically just removes the duff, but doesn't have a lot of effect on the perennials and things in that area. So these are all things we're considering. Let me play this again. And if you'll notice, there are three sides to this fire. And there's three terms that I want you to get familiar with here. Um, when we look at this bottom line here, uh, I think everybody can see the smoke is moving from the bottom left corner to the top right corner of your screen, basically. So this line of fire here, we're going to call the head fire. This is a fire that's pushed by wind. And you can see this here, the effects of this, because the wind is pushing the flames towards the unburned fuels. As that's happening, those flames are laying over. The greater the wind, the higher the flames, the more they're going to lay over there. That's preheating the fuels in front of it. It's also starting to ignite it. So when we have a head fire, we see things like this. You see this fire growing on itself, right? And this will continue to happen and continue to build as it moves across. In contrast to that, at the top here, we've got what we call a backing fire. You can see the smoke is blowing towards the unburned area, or towards the burned area, sorry, towards the black. The flames are very small. It's very slow moving. It's just creeping backwards, right? There's no preheation of the fuels because all the flames are leaning towards the previously burned fuels. And we'll use these types of fires to, to, to have a really slow moving fire or to establish our black line. Um, you know, so when we start a fire, we're typically lighting backing fire. When we're completing maintenance burns, we're typically allowing backing fires to back all the way across the unit. We don't have to have really severe uh, ecological effects. So we're not really trying to set back succession hard. Um, so we're going to use a backing fire to do most of that work. Um, and that's going to benefit us. A flanking fire would be the third type. And that's what you see over here. That's a fire that's parallel with the wind. So the wind's burning it. It's got that line. It's going to slowly move across. It's going to have higher flame lengths than the backing fire, but not as much as the head fire. It's not going to be doing that preheating and that jump that a head fire would do. Um, so we can use that if we need to increase the heat, if we need to try and lift smoke, if we need to try and have a little bit more impact. So, um, so getting into how we can use fire as a management tool. Um, you know, remember, we're trying to control successional change. Um, and then we're also going to use these head fires, backing fires, and flank fires, along with a bunch of other variables that I'm not going to touch on too much today, just because you know, we have whole week-long uh, courses on, on how to actually conduct these burns and apply this stuff. And I want to focus more on why we would implement burns and how that can be used as a tool. Um, so we can use this to maintain an existing successional stage. If we look at the top right corner, you can see we've got grassland habitat that's had some cedars and other hardwoods start to encroach on that. Um, we've come through with a nice low intensity burn. We've been able to torch those cedars and, and, and knock them back. We've been able to uh, force the hardwood uh, 
uh, saplings in there to re-sprout at the ground. And then we've encouraged the grassland habitat. Uh, we can use it to, um, for a particular species. Find my cursor here. Um, this particular flower head you see here is the rattlesnake master. Uh, this is an important species for us. We can use fire to encourage and promote that rattlesnake master by burning in the spring. It behaves very much like a warm season grass, like an Indian grass or a big blue stem does. Um, early April burns seem to propagate the species and encourage it. Um, the interesting thing about this species is, and, and we'll touch on this a little bit more here in just a second, is that it has a globally rare moth that only survives on this species. Um, so while we can use fire to encourage this particular species, uh, we also have to be aware of the fact that some species that depend on it may not respond to fire as well. And so this moth, we have to be careful and weigh the options between using fire to encourage the plant that it needs. But if we use fire too much, then we could actually burn out the moth because it doesn't respond like the plant does to the fire. So these are decisions that we're using or that we're making in our burn plan and the timing of when we're going to burn that we're um, looking at the fuel moisture levels, the weather patterns, the time of year, you know, all these things will go into that so that we can um, hopefully promote this plant and benefit the moth rather than having a negative impact on the moth population. We can also use this um, here below that picture. Um, what you see here is re-sprouting um, white and sweet clover. And so we can use fire as a way to um, encourage seed, uh, the seed bank to germinate invasive or non-native seed that's undesirable to allow us to then come back in and apply herbicide. If you've got a grassland that's got uh, Sericea lespidiza in there, and we see this a lot of times that somebody hears, oh, we should burn our grassland, it would encourage it. And it's got Sericea in there, it's gonna injure the Sericea. That's true, but we've also gotta be aware of the fact that when we send that fire through there um, and create that bare dirt without any thatch or vegetation there, we're gonna allow that Sericea seed that's stored in that seed bank to germinate and start to grow. Um, now, as long as we recognize that that's gonna happen, then we can plan for follow-up treatments immediately after the fire to control those seedlings. So this is a great way for us to release that, that weed seed from the seed bank and then treat that weed seed when it's most susceptible at the seedling stage and get that out of there and start to deplete that seed bank. Um, we run into a lot of problems. Uh, people run into problems when they're not aware of that, that invasive species can respond that way. Typically your perennial, the adult invasive species, most don't, don't respond very well to the fire. Um, but all the seed that they've loaded the seed bank with will really respond well to that removal of the thatch and less competition that you create there. And so you just have to be prepared after that. But we use this all the time to our advantage uh, to stimulate that seed bank, get that seed to sprout, and then we come in and we spray it. We can also use this uh, to clear debris for management for ma management activities. If we've done some, some woody removal or something, um, that's fuel that can increase our fire intensity uh, as we allow that to dry and cure. And then we can use that fire to help remove that stuff um, from the environment or from the, the habitat there and allow the grassland or herbaceous species to, to come up. And we'll actually touch on that a little bit more. I'm going to talk specifically about this project. Um, we can reduce competition for fire tolerant species. So in this picture down here, you've got a lot of young red maple stems here um, that we injured in a fire. And that's really good. They're going to re-sprout from the base. But as long as we can re continue to put that fire back into that system, we can continue to injure those. And those will slowly start to fall out of that system. A lot of times we see when fire has been removed that um, these shade tolerant or fire intolerant species like maple, um, they start to thrive in, in our forest. And that over time creates more shade and structure there that's raising up. And so we lose that grassland or that herbaceous layer underneath our forest. Um, and you all can see this too, go out to your local woods and chances are when you look at your woods, you're gonna have overstory trees that are oak and hickory Right underneath those, you're gonna have mid-story trees that are maple, you know, and you'll probably have a lot of maple in there that creates a lot of shade all the way down and you get a very uh, non-diverse forest floor. You can, you can compare that to other areas that you see when you have oaks and hickories up, you have a wide range of um, 
different size class saplings coming up in there. It's not all maples that have come up right underneath or all maples that are thick, you know, and in those systems, you'll have a lot more herbaceous uh, material at the ground layer. Um, let's see. We can also use fire if we are uh, trying to convert a fescue field to a warm season grass field or stimulate, um, you know, native seed to come out of the seed bank. So there's lots of different ways. One of the big things that's coming up now that you all have probably heard is fuel reduction burns. That's something that the Forest Service is doing a lot. Um, and that's something that they're dealing with out West that, you know, with fire suppression over the years, the, the amount of fuel loading is just built up to a level that they are having these catastrophic wildfires. Uh, consistent, repetitive fire events at low intensity, um, you know, actually help keep the forest healthy and make those fire events much less of a, a drastic or a threat to public health. When we prevent fire from occurring in systems that have naturally had fire, fuel loading is going to build up and it's just a matter of time before that tender box is lit and takes off. And at that time, it becomes very dangerous uh, and is a threat to public health. So some, some important considerations um, for prescribed fire that I'm not going to talk much about, you know, we've got to have clear objectives and a prescription that we're needed. You know, if, if we're not looking to see what's in our, our grassland community before we burn it, we may not realize that there's Teresia lespedisa or sweet clover in there. And when we burn it, if we say, oh, we burned it, it's good, you know, and we, and we weren't prepared for that follow-up, um, we may have just released a lot of weed seed in there and actually had a negative impact on our grassland. So it's very important that we're looking at the site, that we're identifying our objectives and, and setting that prescription to really meet our goals. And I can't tell you all how many times it's happened. And, and the first time that this happened, it was a very tough, tough decision for me to make. But um, when you pull resources from across the state, everybody gets up early. We all go to the site. Everything looks good. We get there. And then as the burn boss, you have to look at that plan and what your objectives are. And if you get to site and you realize the fuel moisture or the, the moisture in the soil is higher than you want it, or the fuels aren't dried as much as you want or the RH is not as low as you want, you may need to call that burn off and send everybody home. And that's a tough decision to make when you've just pulled eight, nine, 10 professionals. Um, they've dragged equipment and everything they've gotten there. Everybody's ready to go. And, or you start the burn. I've started the burn and had to put it out because we're not gonna meet objectives. But what we've learned is that, you know, you have to have these clear objectives and if they're not being met or the conditions don't meet that, don't do it. Because once you run a burn through an area, you've reduced that fuel load. And when you reduce that fuel load, it takes time for it to build back up. So if I go and burn something this year, especially when we're talking about um, restorations of woodland or barren's habitat, where there's a lot of woody component in there, we're wanting to use that grassland fuel to help heat that woody stuff up and cause injury and make it fall out. If we waste that fuel on a day when we're not gonna meet our objectives, then we have to wait sometimes two, three years for that to rebuild before we're able to, to effectively implement another burn. It's not an exact science either. I mean, I've, I've felt really good about some burns and implemented them and, and not met objectives. I've had other times when I pulled back um, and said, no, we're not gonna meet objectives and, and just wait until another time. But I've learned that you're better off to be patient and wait for the right weather conditions that meet your prescription because you're gonna get a lot better result in the end. Um, we also never burn all of one particular type of habitat at one time. So if I've got a hundred acre grassland and it's the only grassland around that's of that quality, a natural grassland with you know good species and low invasives in it, I'm not going to burn all that hundred acres at one time. By doing that, I would you know surely cause an ecological change spatially and within species composition across the site, and that could have negative effects on things like insects, small mammals, on songbirds. And so one thing that you always want to do is make sure that you have refugia close by. And so if I'm going to burn something like that, I may cut that in half. If I have a lot of really rare species that are uh, distributed in a certain way across the site, I might cut that 100 acres into four sites um, to ensure that I don't burn out all of the available habitat in that particular area at one time. And this can get really difficult when you're dealing with things like this Papipema moth up here, which depends on the rattlesnake master I talked about earlier. Um, if we're managing this on, you know, essentially 200 acres um, and we have to break that up, we know it takes about three to four years after a burn event for this moth to recolonize an area. And so I'm constantly juggling the need to, to manage hardwood and, and woody encroachment on the grassland. 
because in three to four years, that can be pretty significant, the amount of shading and the amount of woody material that can pop up in a grassland over four years, especially in, in the area where this occurs, is significant. And so we're having to weigh that against the need for the species to have time to recolonize. So we're splitting that 200 acres. At, um, at one time, we had 12 burn units on that on that site over 200 acres, which is crazy. I mean, that's a lot of work to put in those fire breaks and implement that burn. Now, over time, we've learned more and we've been able to reduce that down. So now we're at about five to six different burn units, depending on what our goals are for the time. Um, so that helps us be better and more efficient at implementing fire and getting that in there. It, it reduces that per acre cost um, on that. But the only reason we know that is because we spent time studying the species and we know how it moves now across the site. And we're ensuring that we have um, small populations nearby burn units that can then recolonize. So. Um, of course, we always have to consider for personnel and public safety, and we always have to plan for an escape. Um, now, we do have escapes happen fairly, I mean, there's at least one or two a season, but they're minor because we've written into that burn plan and we're all prepared. We know if that fire escapes, this is the place where it most likely will escape. This is how we're going to attack that it, when it escapes. And so, um, you know, we're planning for that ahead of time, and if nothing happens, great. We wasted a little bit of time planning for that, but when it happens, you're really glad that you've got that plan. And you definitely, when we're trying to promote prescribed fire, we definitely don't want to burn down the neighbor's barn or burn down a city or, or burn somebody's woods up that, that didn't want fire in it. Um, that's not going to be a very good story for prescribed burns uh, and using prescribed fire into the future. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple sites that we got and uh, this is Crooked Creek. This is an Oak Barrens. Um, and you can see here that we've got grassland habitat. We've got scattered trees across it. The only way we maintain this is with some type of disturbance and fire is, is the one that, that fits this best. And so we will occasionally go in and, uh, and have a backing fire that will help increase residency time on these small stems. And when we talk about residency time, Look at um, this one stem here and look at how fast the fire is moving. It's very slow. It stays on those stems for a long time. And so the longer we can keep that fire on those stems, the greater the effect that we're going to have on them and cause them to re-sprout uh, or die off. And so we want to light our fire in a way that increases that, that moves the fire slow, and that's through using backing fires. And when we do that, we create this nice complex that has shrubs, trees, but also we get lots of rare species, grassland communities, you know, we've got sunflowers, we've got big blue stem up here in the right corner. It's hard to see, but we've got some prairie dock in there. You get uh, things like slender liatris, uh, which is state listed, things like the Indian paintbrush, which are state listed. And the only way that we allow these species to persist is by these periodic fires that come into these systems uh, to help maintain that grassland. You can see here, as cool as this picture looks with the flowers and everything, we've got trees growing up in there. And if we don't do something about that in the near future, they will slowly start to shade out and choke out that prairie habitat. Another way that we're using fire to preserve our natural heritage, this site here uh, probably looks similar to some of the forests you're familiar with. There's lots of red maple in here, lots of sourwood, um, a few other understory species that, you know, are not doing as many favors that are just shading out the ground. And one of the interesting things about this site is we started noticing that wherever there was an opening, we were starting to get big blue stem, some solidago, some sunflowers, some blueberries, you know, things that, in, that thrive better in systems with more sunlight. And so we were really feeling confident that this used to be more of a pine oak barrens and that we needed to thin out that canopy and allow those species to come back. And there was some work out of Tennessee that just encouraged this. You know, they found on Catoosa Wildlife Management Area that after 65 years of fire suppression, and the canopy of this forest closing in and shading out all that grassland habitat, when they started opening that canopy back up and when they started burning, um, they started getting all kinds of prairie and grassland species coming back in. Uh, the grass and the herbaceous ground cover, you know, increased. The diversity was, let's say, 8 to 24 times greater in the areas that were burned and cut in the areas that were not. And, and so that was further encouragement that we still had time to do something with this uh, former pine oak barrens to reestablish that grassland habitat and preserve those for, for our future generations. 
So we removed the understory by hand and then went in and uh, after two years of that wood laying and drying, we completed a prescribed burn on there. So this was the spring of 2021. This fire took, um, we planned this fire for 20 years, but or wanted to do a fire on here for over 20 years. Um, but this fire has actually been in the planning and implementation stages since about 2000, spring of 2018. So it took us almost three years to actually implement this fire. Um, but once, and this is just a quick video the fire had moved through. I think this was two days after. So to the untrained eye, this looks pretty devastating. You know, you think, oh my gosh, they killed everything. But here we are, just six to eight weeks post-fire. You can see we've cleared out a lot of that brush underneath there. We've got things green back up. We're going to continue to work on this area. We'll implement another burn on this in two or three years. And we expect and we're already seeing a lot more sun loving species starting to pop up this summer. Um, and that's gonna continue as long as we continue to have these fire events in there. The trees that are, are supposed to be here, um, like the black oak and uh, short leaf pine, they did fine with the fire. Um, they've spread it back out and they're gonna continue to be fine. The red maples that have breached the canopy, uh, along with girdling, the fire has injured them and caused places where disease and insect can get in. And as we repeat those fire events, we're gonna to continue to further damage those maples. But luckily, we had good enough fire effects that almost every maple uh, and tree sapling across the site under two and a half inches was pretty much top dead. And so that's, that's pretty awesome. That's a pretty effective fire at controlling that shade. I mean, that's a lot of shade that was put on that ground there and that's gonna encourage those grassland species to move back into the system. So um, I've got one more site, but I, I'm gonna jump through it just in the sake of time here. I wanna leave you with a couple of resources here if you're interested in fire and wanna learn some more. Um, the Joint Fire Science Program is a great program. They offer a lot of research briefs. And so they take the very detailed scientific peer reviewed papers um, and they cut those down to the important parts for a manager to understand. So if you're interested in fire and learning more about how fire can be used, I encourage you to go look at the Oak Woodland Forest Fire Consortium or the consortium of Appalachian fire managers, depending on where you're at in the state and what type of habitat you're dealing with, they can give you some further information and more detailed information about how fire can be used and what the effects of fire are afterwards. I also wanna point out that the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council is a great resource, it's kyfire.org. Um, we put on a burn boss training and we got one coming up this fall in September. Um, and we also put on an eight hour landowner course. Now, if you're just interested in fire, you may wanna do a little bit of fire on your own site or you just want to learn more about how to actually put how to actually implement a prescribed burn um, that eight hour landowner course would be a great thing uh, for you to take uh, you can sign up for that we're going to be offering those in uh, madison in uh, bullet and in um, muhlenberg counties here coming up in october um, so you want to check that out um, and then i'll just leave you with this beautiful picture of a grassland burn that we did um, we had had some dogwoods and some cedars move into this grassland and so we burned those out. Um, this was spring of 2019. My email address is here, my phone number. If you've got questions and, and don't, we don't have time to get to them all today, uh, you can feel free to contact me. Or if you've got questions about the fire council or anything else, um, you know, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to, to bring more people into the fire world and, and promote using prescribed fire. Cause I think it's one of the most important tools that we have to really restore and preserve our grasslands in Kentucky. And I hope that I've shown today that grasslands, you know, are dependent upon this disturbance to persist and that fire is an important ecological tool for us to do that. And then, um, you know, there's lots of research out there that shows that the more we use fire in these systems, the more diversity we get, the more diversity we get, the better opportunity species have to persist in the landscape, especially with all the other actions that uh, humans have, have been taking over the last uh, century or more that have had a negative impact on those systems. So uh, with that, I think I'll stop and open it up for questions. All right, thank you, Josh, very much. It was a great presentation, a ton of information. Um, and uh, we do have some questions um, right away, but I, I really appreciate uh, you sharing all of that with us and the fact that there are those two other trainings that if for people who are um, viewing today, you're really interested in this, 
um, definitely the eight hour landowner thing. That would be a nice introduction to it. And also for those of you that are current master naturalists, that's continuing education hours for you as well. So something to think about. Um, but again, thanks, that was great. Um, let's hop to some questions. We had during your talk, um, someone asked, when the presentations ended, could um, Josh put uh, the slides with the river system of Kentucky back up? And that they maybe had a question here. And if you did, if you type in if what your question was, if you type that in for me, that would be awesome. So yeah, this is a, near the pre-settlement um, map and that they don't have, they just ask if you could put it back up. Maybe they wanted to see it again. I don't have a... So I'll say that um, there's a couple of books that we've got. Um, there's um, the one about the Heritage Land Conservation Fund and then there's one about biodiversity in Kentucky. And um, this map is available in, the, in those books. And um, if you wanted to purchase that book, the one about biodiversity, well, both of them are very good books. But the one about biodiversity talks a lot more detail about um, succession and about uh, managing for biodiversity in the state and shares multiple maps related to this. So that would be a good resource if you're interested in, in more information on, on thinking about where Kentucky was in the past. Okay. Yeah, those are some good ones. I know I've seen the biodiversity one for sure. Um, and I was going to say, we got someone a comment. Um, uh, it says it was also it's also great to have plant species of different ages deal with the different life cycles of the insects just a comment there and um, another participant asked what is the name of the moth again that's connected with the rattlesnake master uh pappy pima oringia it's the rattlesnake master boar moth rattlesnake master boar moth awesome i did not realize that that was um that that rare because we where I worked in parks we planted um, rattlesnake master. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question was um, what yeah, about Lori. Just to be clear, uh, rattlesnake master the plant is not rare, but the mm -hmm. it depends on it. it has a very very small niche. Um, uh -huh. That's so. awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, what about burns for weed and brush control and landowner on landowners embankments? Um, I mean, fire can definitely be used for that. Like I say, we can use fire to reduce um, that vegetation and make it easily uh, readable, or you could just use fire periodically to burn out the ditches and things of that nature. I mean, um, essentially fire, you know, can be used in place of a bush hog. A bush hog is a disturbance um, tool that we use to knock back succession. Um, it doesn't, we don't get all the benefits that we get from using a bush hog that we get from using fire. You know, the, the bush hog tends to compact the soil and cause erosion issues, whereas fire usually invigorates the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and help have positive effects on that. Um, yeah, anywhere that, um, that you use a bush hog to control vegetation, I mean, fire could be an applicable alternative to that. Given a lot of other factors as far as uh, your capacity, its relation to structures and houses and things of that nature. Right, and would you mention the fire, we have two fire seasons in Kentucky and a little bit about what they're, if this is a landowner doing something on their property, what some of the rules and regulations are during those fire seasons? Yeah, um, so I'll say the best resource for that is to come to the eight hour landowner course. Yeah. <laughs> what a landowner can do and how they would do it and when they can do it. But there are two fire seasons. Um, the fall fire season runs, I think October 1st through November 15th and then mm -hmm fire season runs um i think it's february through april yep mm -hmm. something like that um those are the times when we're typically out burning and when you have a certified burn boss um certificate then you are exempt from those now we still follow county burn bans if we get to watch out situation um but that's the times when we're typically out burning and getting the best effects um but as a landowner after 6 p.m um, you know, you could burn on your land as long as you took the proper steps um, to control it. But I'll mention that the reason that I encourage people to go get the burn boss training, if you really want to use fire as a tool on your property, is because burning after 6 p.m., you have a lot more smoke issues, which are going to affect your neighbors. You don't get the fire intensity and the fire effects that you would get if you burn that in the 
the day when your RHs are low and then environment is just better to have a fire. You know, so the fire is gonna be a lot milder. It's gonna be a lot slower. It's not gonna have the heat. You're gonna have the smoke issues if you're burning after dark there. And so that's why we do the certification program and get trained so that we can burn at the time of day when we can be most effective. And like wrestling that we burned at night, if you have areas with really, really heavy fuels, um, those are great areas to burn late at night when the RH is lower and it reduces the fire intensity so it's easier to control. Okay, great. Another question, if a prescribed burn isn't practical in a barrens area being succeeded by woody plants, what are the next best management options? Um, probably some type of um, rotary cutter, um, you know, depending on the sensitivity of the site, that may be a DR mower, that may be hand loppers and a chainsaw, um, but then also using herbicide to treat those stems, you know, uh, whatever stem you cut, you want to paint that stem there. And, and we do have some sites where they're just uh, some glades or something like that that are so small that we just, we do most of that by hand um, because the fire is just not practical from a, a cost and a implementation standpoint. Okay, great. Um, so another one, burning for landowner embankments that have Japanese knotweed and creeping type foliage. Yeah, um, I mean, fire would be a good option for that because those are hard to get into and hard to, to control. But um, fire is only going to be the removal tool for those vegetation. It's not going to be the control. The control is going to be the follow-up herbicide applications that you apply to those embankments after the fire. The fire would just allow you uh, to kind of clear that stuff out so that you can get in there. And, and you may even have to burn, um, herbicide some of those just to dry them out well enough so that you can actually get a fire to carry through them depending on how, how severe the, the mess is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So essentially, I mean, it's, it's not just one... One, one and done. Yeah. You, you get with invasive plants, something it's we're always dealing with them. It's a continual thing. Yes. <laughs> okay, another one. I'm concerned about erosion control after burning hillsides. Do successional grasses typically respond well enough after prescribed burn disturbance to minimize manual intervention or planting? Yeah, so. Um... You know, after a fire goes through, you're not really burning out the roots and things. Um, and if you're worried about erosion in that area, you know, a spring burn would be a good option to burn. And, um, you know, if you're burning and trying to control woody stuff, April 1st to April 10th is about the window you want to be in. Um, you like to have those maples where their end buds are just starting to swell, like they're getting ready to come out. That means they're sucking a lot of water out of the ground. They're going to reduce the moisture in the ground and they're going to be more susceptible to that management. Um, by doing that also, you're, you know, in six to eight weeks, it's already graining back up and helping to hold that soil. But uh, the roots of those trees are still going to be in the ground. The roots of most of your perennial stuff are still going to be there. Um, we've got enough time there and barring any monsoon type torrential rain events uh, real heavily immediately after the fire. Um, you do get minimal erosion, but I've not seen that be a problem many times when we plan for that in the planning process, you know. Great. Well, that's, and this appears to be all of our questions. We've had numerous thank yous with exclamation points. Um, so if you do have any questions, go ahead and pop those in now in the chat box. Um, but I wanted to ask, so you all as, and I may have missed it in your presentation, but you all, if you do burnings on private lands and public lands, correct? Is that? Um, nature preserves typically only burns on public land. Um, okay. You know, and um, that's just simply because of the way our statutes are written, we're not a private uh, donor uh, agency. We don't do with that much. We do work with private landowners when they have rare species present, but we don't have a funding mechanism to provide that service. Now, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife and Kentucky Division of Forestry both kind of fill that niche as far as um, helping private landowners burn. Um, but, you know, it's with the Fire Council, um, and working with Division of Forestry and Division of Fish and Wildlife, we recognize that we need to get uh, more landowners trained to do this, get more private contractors in the state. Um, there is a bit of a, a, just a black hole there when somebody says, hey, fire's great. I want to do this good stuff on my private property. How do we do it? And that's something that a lot of us in, in um, you know, with the fire council are working on trying to find a solution, a better solution for uh, currently. But nature preserves would not be the one to do that. That would be uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Okay. Okay, but like you said, coming to that eight hour landowner training is a good start. So, yes. Yes. Right. 
And also, again, reaching out to the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources and to the Kentucky Division of Forestry as well. And then a lot of times they can help maybe connect you, like you said, with a, a private uh, vendor or consultant. There are a few out there in the state that do some of this. Yeah. Um, now there says, if you were to make a wish list or locations that would benefit from prescribed burns, but are currently not feasible, what would your number one location be and why is it not currently possible? Um, so this is one that I'm working on heavily at the moment. Um, and it's a big one is um, Pine Mountain. Um, that mountain needs to burn more, um, but it, it's a very complicated um, thing because you have a lot of structure and you have very high topography. You know, you're talking a thousand foot elevation change from the bottom to the top, very remote. It's not safe to send people down on the mountain, but we have a lot of species um, and plant communities on Pine Mountain that are associated with that fire disturbance. And we're going to lose those if we can't figure out how to put those in there. Now, the mountain burns regularly from, from wildfire. Um, mm -hmm. We need to find a better way um, to make sure that it's burning um, when it's supposed to and not when it's not. You know, because too many fires too fast on an area can have a negative impact. Um, fires not frequent enough can have a negative impact on it. And so we're currently working on how, how would we even go about doing that because that's just so far out of the realm of what we've done within the state to this point um, to, to implement burns on that scale. You know, and we're talking large, large acreage there, um, really large acreage. So um, that's one of the things that I'm currently working on. The Cumberland Plateau, there should be a lot more fires through the Cumberland Plateau. I mean, just period. Um, those ridge tops with that sandstone and the shortleaf pine um, and the woodland communities there, um, more fire in the Cumberland Plateau outside of the Daniel Boone National Forest um, would be a, a great great thing in an area that's needed. Um, and then of course the grassland, the barren area out west, but a lot of that is in farmland now. Um, so unless it's a, a remnant or uh, a grassland that somebody's managing, um, you know, there's not much point in burning the agricultural or the hay fields. Um, that's gonna be counterproductive to what those acres are being used for by landowners. So, um, but yeah, Pine Mountain, Cumberland Plateau or two that, that I work on regularly and that um, we're pushing to, to do more and larger and better better fire uh, while also accounting for the uh, the public safety side of things. Awesome. Well, great. Good to know, good to know. Um, and I think that it looks like all of our questions uh, for now. So um, again, Josh, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing um, your knowledge on prescribed fire as a management tool. Um, I did want to mention we are planning as Kentucky Master Naturalist to host uh, with Josh an in-person and field trip probably in the spring, I think is what we've been talking about. So be looking for that. We'll have some information out about that later um, in, um, in the year. But again, thank you, Josh. And um, um, really, really appreciate it. And please join us for the next two sessions we have on the following Fridays. Next week, we have Megan Bulin from the University of Kentucky talking about mushrooms. And then um, the following Friday, we will have Kendall um, from the State Nature Preserves who will be talking about lichens. So um, we hope to see you there. And uh, remember, I think everyone's gotten their name in the chat. So for those in the extension service, we can give you credit through CURS. But again, thanks for joining us for the Kentucky Master Naturalist um, Summer Zoom Series. And we'll hope to see you next week. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye.